Everybody's got your Bibles? Let me see those, please. Physical Bibles, hold them up. Good to see you two. Been a minute. Welcome, welcome. Electronic Bibles? Well done. I can't get away from this, so let me just do it and relieve my my burden. Um, Stephen, most of the times that I've prayed for you, it's because you've been in a jam. That's that's typically in this type of setting. Is when there's an issue, a crisis. That's not today. I really felt impressed earlier to say to you in this way. I know we have a bunch of people in the house that are faithful. Faithful. And I mean no, nothing disparaging towards anybody else when I say the Lord wants you to know that he sees your faithfulness to him, to the house, and to me, not that I think I'm anything special, because I don't, but the Lord sees what you're putting into it to make it happen, and I don't understand what it's going to be, and I'm not trying to get, um, I'm not trying to get in the weeds on it. All I know is the Lord says he's about to quickly honor you for your faithfulness to all three. So I don't know what that looks like. I have a real sense that you're going to know when it happens. And you're going to say, this, this is a gift from the Lord. Just because of the faithfulness that I've been. Hallelujah. Oh, Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I got a couple of quotes for you. One of them, and I don't, I don't know who this is. His name is Chris Hogan. And he said, excuses are just lies wrapped in reason. Excuses are lies wrapped in reason. My wife posted this next one, and I searched and searched and searched for it. And about the time I gave up is when I found it. And it says, faithful people have just as many excuses as the unfaithful. They just refuse to use them. So I'm going to talk today for the next few moments about the three Hebrews that Daniel knew and got tossed into the fiery furnace. And just to give you just a little bit of a background, first of all, you guys remember King Nebuchadnezzar? And I can just hear Nigel in my, in my mind saying King Nebs. <laughs> so King Nebs had made a huge statue. Some records say 90 feet or the equivalent to nine stories high, and it was all gold. How many's ever picked up a, a huge amount of gold, a, a handful of gold? Gold is heavy. And so he was very proud of it, and so he called a meeting to which everyone who was anyone was told that whenever this particular music played, that they were to fall down and worship his golden idol. I assumed that it was a little bit like, uh, uh, what's that game you play when you go around the, the seats and then, what's it called? Musical chairs. Everybody said it at once, and it came out muffled. So it's like kind of like musical chairs. And so you know when the music comes on, boom, you know, you gotta you gotta bow. And so if you didn't, you were tossed into a fiery furnace. Now, 
How many's ever seen a furnace? How many has a furnace in your house? How many's never seen a furnace? How many didn't vote? Got too warm in here. So this furnace is not the one that you kind of open the door and stoke the fire. This is, I would imagine the furnace would be equivalent to maybe this room or maybe half of this room. I see it as just being absolutely ginormous. Uh, they, would, they would melt metals and, and all types of things in this. And so um, to be tossed into that is kind of like William Tyndale. Tie them up and throw them in. You can't, you can't get loose, and so you, you die. How many have ever been in a place that's so hot you couldn't hardly breathe? That's how I know heaven's going to be cool. Who said a funny? What did I miss? Not here. That's right. That's why you can breathe here. So in Daniel chapter 3, verse 12, it says, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon. Listen, there's tattletales everywhere. <laughs> there's just tattletales everywhere. And so he goes, so namely, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They don't serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So King Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, gave a command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego these men were brought before the king. So Nebuchadnezzar had said to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you're ready when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, very good. But if you do not worship... You shall be thrown at once into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can rescue out of my hands? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, King Nebs, we do not need to answer you on this point. And if it be so, our God whom we serve, oh, 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 not whom we prayed to, not our God who we said a salvation prayer, but our God whom we serve is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you set up. Sometimes I catch myself thinking about very, very difficult stuff. And I fast forward in my mind to the point that the church is truly persecuted by the government. I don't mean the fact you don't get a tax break. I mean persecuted. Lock you up, kill you, dismember you, whatever it takes in order to intimidate all that you know and are associated with, that they ought not serve the God that you serve. I remember as a kid, I watched a, a movie, and I don't remember the title of the movie, um, but it was about those that missed the rapture. Left Behind. Left Behind. Not the cool new one with all the great graphics. Old school. And they set up a, a, a guillotine. And back in those days, to see the internals of somebody's neck was like, oh, my God. Now today is like, you know, watch. Because we are so numb to blood, guts, death, destruction. So I remember them being asked, if you will just denounce Jesus, We'll let you go. But if you don't, that basket's going to catch your head. And one by one, they led their heads in this guillotine. And I can still see it as a kid, the huge blade at an angle that came down. And the sound that it made when it hit the end 
and the sound of the head falling in the wicker basket. I look at that, if you want to know the honest truth, as sweet relief. You want to know why? Because that's a quick way to die. I don't know that we're going to have it that gracious. If if we don't pursue God and pursue people now, What makes us think that we will pursue God or pursue people then? Now, we'll nod an agreement right now because you're free to do so. And you think, oh, well, you know, if things get really bad, I'll, 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 I'll tell people, here's the problem. Between now and the time that things get really bad, there's going to be a lot of people die. Remember that video I told you about, about the man that died for 15 minutes? Thousands of people stood before God. 50 of them made it in in those 15 minutes. Everybody else got the depart from me speech. Job 13. Job 13, verse 15. One verse. Even though he kills me, Job speaking of God, even though he kills me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways to his face. King James says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, Job's view was skewed because it wasn't God that was slaying him. It was the enemy that was trying to slay him. But God prevented that. Isn't it amazing that a lot of the things that we blame God for is really the enemy in disguise, and when the, when the blinders come off and we realize, oh my goodness, Lord, that wasn't you. <laughs> if there's something bad happening in your life, God is not behind it. Every good and perfect gift, the Bible says, comes from the Father of lights. So think about this with me for just a minute. How did these men get so faith-strong that they didn't waver even in the face of death. How did that happen? We work so hard to preserve this life that we typically make little to no preparation for the forever. I saw a pastor recently, as a part of his message, he, he read quotes from atheists on their deathbed, many of them very well known, very famous. In fact, most of us probably had to study a, m most of them in school. And they would say, I have missed it. I spent my whole life preparing for life and I made no preparation for death. I didn't believe that there was a God or hell. And at this moment, I now know there's both and I know there's no hope for me. Just very fatalistic. How many of you like funerals? Funeral homes, crematoriums, caskets, headstones, burial plots, cemeteries. Most of us spend our entire existence trying to avoid them. But we have an absolute date set with them. The very thing we're trying to avoid, every day that we get up and we take a fresh breath of a morning, we are another day closer to the very thing that we try and spend our whole life in existence trying to avoid. What we are running from, God is anticipating. 
Blessed in the sight of God are the death of whom? His saints. Why? Because now there's no restriction. There's no earth suit. You guys remember in the height of COVID, they wouldn't let people see each other. Grandmas and grandpas were dying in homes and whatnot. They were putting their hands on windows. They could see, but they couldn't touch. They could, they could hear, but they couldn't feel. I think that's in some ways how God feels about us. This earth suit's in the way. And he's looking forward to the day that the earth suit is laid down and we're free to be with him. He's, he's anticipating that and we say that we are, but we live our life in such a way that we do, we're trying to avoid it at all costs. Daniel 3.19. Go back to Daniel. Then King Nebs was filled with fury, and his facial expression changed towards the boys. And then he gave a command that the furnace was to be heated seven times hotter than usual. Verse 20. He commanded certain strong men in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. These three men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their turbans, and other clothes, and were thrown into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was extremely hot, the flame of the fire killed the men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Then King Nebs looked and was astounded, and he jumped up and said to his counselors, did we not throw three men who were tied up into the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He answered, Look, I see four men untied walking around in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebs approached the door of the blazing furnace and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's servants, watch this, of the most high God, Come out of there and come here. So they came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered around them and saw that in regard to these men, the fire had no effect on their bodies. Their hair was not singed. Their clothes were not scorched or damaged. Even the smell of smoke was not on them. So Nebs responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants who believed in trusted in and relied on him they violated the king's command and surrendered their bodies rather than serve or worship any god except their own therefore i make a decree that any people nation or language that speaks anything offensive against the god of shadrach meshach and abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses made a heap of rubbish for there is no other god who is able to save in this way then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image that you have set up. None of that would have happened if they had not made a stand. None of it. They were faced with a hard decision and a time where God was wanting to demonstrate through them, how to do things right. How to do things right. That's something I fight with, how to do things right. How many's ever heard of R.W. Shambach? How many's ever listened to him preach? I remember growing up when I was living at home, we were getting ready for Sunday morning church. Thank God we're in Sunday afternoon. And um, we'd turn on the radio or the TV, and either Jimmy Swaggart or R.W. Shambach would be preaching. And I saw a video a brother Shambach on TBN, I think I posted it. And he said, when I was a kid, he said, I would watch videos 
But I also went to the meetings of T.L. Osborne. Nobody's ever heard of T.L. Osborne. And so he said there was a, a boxer, kind of a famous guy, and his, his, uh, his promoters pushed him too hard too fast because he was a young guy. And he took too many blows to the face, and he lost his vision in both eyes. And so T.L. Osborne called him out, grabbed him by the hand, said, come up here. And Shambach said, I was there. I saw this happen. And he said he grabbed him, put his hands on his face, and commanded sight. And he said immediately he was able to see out of both eyes. So then Shambach had a little banter and said, you know, T.L. Osborne used to say that he had copyrighted his messages. And he said, Shambach, I've done that so that you have the right to copy anything that I do. I love that part. And so Shambach used to tell him and said, you know, you wrote them, but I preached them better than you did. <laughs> but the quote that got me the most is when he said, T.L. Osborne used to say, no man should have the right to preach a word that he's incapable of demonstrating. If you can't demonstrate it, don't preach it. I strive to be that. I strive to be that. I want to demonstrate, just like Paul said, I don't come with flowery speech, but I come in demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. So here they are in a, in a hard decision. And if they'd chosen to bow down and compromise their principles, they would still die. They may not have died in the furnace, but they would have still died. Now they would have died with a confession and a demonstration to all the people that you better do what the king says. Here's the issue. Some of y'all think that the way you're living is only affecting you. And you don't understand other people are reading you. You ever seen a blind person who wanted to know how, what you look like? And so they asked if they could touch your face? And they are all over your face, up your nostrils and everything. I mean, they're, every little, your ears. Why? Because they're, they're drawing a picture. Do you know that there are people that are in your life that are watching your posts on Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, X, on, on everything that you're on? They watch the way you drive, what bumper stickers you put on, how you, how you talk, how you tip, where you walk, who you hang out with, who you avoid. They, they're watching everything. They, they are checking you out to find out how it is that you live because the way you live is a testament. It is a, it is a description of how you expect others that you know to live. Some of y'all are playing Russian roulette with your life. Just want one more day to do what I want to do. Here's, here's the thing. When God gives you a heart transplant, you're still doing what you want to do. It's just that what, now what you want to do is aligned with what he wants you to do. So you never stop doing what you want to do. You just have to pick which heart you're going to use. Does that make any sense to anybody? Did God have a purpose in allowing all this to happen to the three Hebrews? I believe he did. Could it be that he wanted to challenge them to be faithful and to believe even while facing something very difficult? When, when, when news comes, I don't always have a, an opportunity to find a quiet place, an altar, put on the right music, dim the lights, and have me an hour and a half of just me hanging out with God in order to get prepared to walk into the mess that I just heard about. There's times where you just you come up on a mess. You find yourself in the middle of a mess. You get a phone call that instantly drags you into a mess, and if you are not prepared at that moment, then you ain't going to be prepared. It's far easier to have all the meal prep done, meat, veggies, drinks, ice, and put away tonight so that tomorrow all we do is just pull them out and put it together for the men. It's a far different thing when three hours before the men's meeting we're at Sam's feverishly rushing through the, the store and piling stuff in. I'm serious. That gives you a little bit more modern understanding. Can you get it done? Well, it may not taste as good. You might still get full, but it, it's not going to be as great to the palate. 
Why? It wasn't prepared. I mean, you took that frozen meat and threw it in the microwave. You know what I'm saying? Didn't just let it thaw out. And this is what we're trying to do with our spiritual life and walk. We just coast until we bump into a problem. Then we try to microwave our faith. That's, what, that's why we got to choose. When I get up in the morning, I choose as an act of my will to follow and obey Jesus today. And when I wake up the next one, I choose as an act of my will, no matter what happens, no matter what phone call I get, no matter, no matter who's president, no matter who's king, no matter what the economy's doing, no matter what the bull market's doing, no matter what anything that's happening, my faith, my hope, I choose to follow him. The three Hebrew kids did three things right. Three things. Yeah, I'm going to say it like that too. Have you noticed that most of the time what's popular is not right or healthy? Have you noticed? Whatever the big push in media is, it's typically wrong have you am i making this up or have you seen this for yourself don't 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 let me don't let me think that i'm trying to indoctrinate you at this point i'm asking what your experience has been when 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 you see all this bad stuff oh my goodness it's going to be horrible the things are going to go oh my goodness and then didn't happen we're going to have watermelon sized hail in 30 minutes (laughs) we didn't even get a drizzle Here's what's been advertised to the kids. Your mom and dad are old fuddy-duddies. They they bought into religion, okay? Religion is just like Hare Krishna. It's just like, you know, Islam. It's just just religion. It's, it's, It's an escape route for people to not feel bad about their junk. Okay? That's that's what they're telling our kids. So our kids come to church, watch this, with a a desensitized sensitivity. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I look across the room and I can tell who's on spiritual Novocaine. I can tell who's numb. So the kids are taught it's just mom and dad's religion. And unfortunately for some, if their parents die young and these young adolescents are growing up without mom or dad, all of a sudden, out of sentimentality, they'll start going to church. Well, I used to go with grandma. Well, I used to go with mom and dad. Well, I used to hang out with, I, I, just, I just go for, just for a sense of peace, right? Until one day God sucker punches them. He sets a hook at them and says, it's not a joke. It's real. But they had to have that, their own encounter. Here's my point. We have, oh yeah, I'd say it like that too. In the same way that parents too often try to shield their kids from the consequences of their actions, Nicholas goes, he never did. Nicholas goes and, and, and steals $100 worth of stuff from the store, and the cops find out, I have to go bail him out, pay the court cost, remunerate the store, take off work, all the stuff that I've got to do. What, I'm paying the price. Okay? And so we try so often to shield our kids. How many of you, when, when your kids get sick or they're in the hospital for whatever reason, and how many times have you told the Lord, Lord, I'll just allow me to have that. I'll take that in their stead. I, I just don't want my kids to have to. You don't want them to have a broken heart, a skinned knee, a broken bone, uh, you know, to be sick and have to go. You, you don't want them to deal with any of that stuff. And, and you, you, you try to intercept that. It's dangerous for us to do that. They have to, what's going to happen when you're dead? And now they are absolutely ill-prepared. Here's our problem. We're not training our kids. We're not teaching our kids. We're not demonstrating for our kids. We're not letting our kids know about bad stuff that's happening. They're going to find out whether they know why you're living or when you're dead. I didn't know that dad was that far into debt. I didn't know that he had these kind of medical conditions. I didn't know that. You still got, you can't stop them from knowing
And we do that in the spirit. We try to cover them in such a way that they don't have the burden. They don't have a fight. They don't have to worry. I got this. And instead, what we need to be doing is saying, come on, son. I'm right behind you. They ain't going to mess with you. I got this, but you're going to face them. Let's go. You, you, oh. When was the last time you heard your kids pray? Do they know how to pray? Or do they default to what they memorized? Our Father who art in heaven. That is, a, that is a template. That is not a substitute for having your own words. Do your kids know how to pray? If you were in the hospital and you were intubated and you couldn't communicate, could your kids pray for you? Could they? And if they can't, it's on you. But you want to know why that smacks me in the face so bad? Because if you can't pray, that's on me. If you can't function the gifts, that's on me. If you don't know what to do, that's on me. That's why I preach a little bit different than a lot of the people that I know. Because if I want to stand before God for you, I'm at least going to be able to say, Dad, I told them. They knew. You know what I mean? Here's what they did right. Number one, they were committed. How were they committed? They chose to eat with Daniel the, the less desirable food of exile. Why? They didn't want to become comfortable with the new menu. They didn't want to be comfortable with the enemy. They didn't want to be comfortable in a place that God had not prepared for them. They did not want to be comfortable living above their means. They didn't want something just because it looked good and smelled good. I posted another video. Blew my mind. Because I thought Doritos was Doritos worldwide. It's not. I did not know that until today. So in the United States, Doritos is full of Red 40 and all kinds of bioengineered materials that is proven to give sickness. I'll be careful what I say so that it doesn't get, you know, chopped. Okay. But if you find Doritos in Canada, natural colorings, natural flavorings, natural, 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 natural. I have all but, I do on occasion, but I have almost completely sworn off pop. There's just sometimes that Mexican just don't taste right without the, you know, some, just sometimes. <laughs> But what's happened is, watch, the flavor has changed because the ingredients have changed. So you know when I have to have a Coca-Cola? Not when I go to the grocery store. But when I find a truly authentic Mexican restaurant that has bottled Coke from Mexico. Want to know why? Because they don't have the bio garbage that our grocery stores do. They still have pure cane sugar. They still have other ingredients that are far more natural than the bio stuff that's Y'all hear anything I'm saying? So these boys did not want to get accustomed to the new Doritos. They did not want to get accustomed to the high life and these, these fancy plates and all this stuff because they knew it was not good for them. They wanted what God had given them. They wanted God's food, and God honored that in them. Secondly, they chose their companions well. Oh. They chose their companions well. Who's your companions? Tell the truth. Let me, let me ask this. How many of you would be a little bit embarrassed to bring your companions to church with you? Because you've got a church life, and then you've got an outside church life, right? You've got your church friends, and then you've got your outside church friends. And so you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to 
play both sides, you know what I'm saying? And so it's very, very difficult because you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to mix the two. God forbid you had you had some of your friends show up and your car is parked outside of the local marijuana joint, you know what I'm saying? Or or they they they, they happen to go into Chili's and, and you ain't sitting in the family area, you you cozy it up to the bar. Oh, Trying to keep the, well, you know, that's, that's this, this, this part of my life, and this is, no, listen, when you get married, you can't say to your, your, your future spouse, I'm going to give you all my life except this part right over here. You, you, you got 98%, but it's two, it's 2%. That's how we're trying to play God. God, I'm giving you 78.6% of my life. That's better than 75 last week. Glory. God says, when you come to me, you come wholly to me. You don't cut 76 point or 72 point, whatever I said, out and give me that. We ain't pulling a Solomon, just cut off the part, God, that don't please you. Who are your companions? Are you keeping company with other, other believers or will just anybody do? I just hear some of y'all. Well, Jesus hung out with sinners. I'm going to tell you what. If you will say... If you will say to your sinner friends what Jesus said to his sinner friends, I won't give you any mess. The problem is you want to hang undercover as a chameleon, hanging out, doing what they're doing, saying what they're saying, drinking what they're drinking, smoking what they're smoking, eating what they're eating, going where they're going, seeing what they're seeing and doing what they're doing, and say that's Jesus. Somebody lied to you. Every sinner that Jesus hung out with, he said, you know you're doing wrong. You know that ain't right. You know it. And if you'll put that bottle down and drink the water that I'll give you. But here's the problem. What we're carrying isn't from God. So we can't say if you'd put that bottle down and, and, down and drink the water that I'll give you, you won't thirst like that again. We can't do that because we're not like him. We're like our daddy, the devil. Anybody hear anything I'm saying? Do you keep company with people who walk the right paths intensely or do you hang with the people that are luring you to the other side? Here's, here's what some of y'all are doing. I'm just testing to see where I am spiritually because if I can put up with that temptation and not go there, then I'm doing good. You an idiot for subjecting yourself to temptation. Are you hanging out with people that are mostly always negative? I need to send my food back. I asked it for 98.6 degrees, and it came back at 95. <laughs> I need to send my plate back. The asparagus has crossed the line, and it's touching my mashed potatoes. It, it doesn't matter what you do for them. They're going to be upset. Always complaining. Out of the abundance of the the. So if they are constantly complaining, it's because they're rotten on the inside. Why are you hanging out with rotten people? Well, Jesus loves them. Yes, and he sent them the same word he sent you. Why don't you be the living word in front of them and give them something to aspire to be instead of you getting to see how close you can aspire to be like them? Got to pick your comrades, man. Got to pick who you're hanging out with. Hang out with people that inspire you to be something better in the Lord than what you've ever been. It's kind of like this. How many of you were the, were the big kid in your, in your school class? It's because it, you might have got held back or something, so you, you was older, bigger, stronger, and so you kind of feel good when you walked in the room, all the little kids just hand out their milk money. You know what I mean? They didn't even fight you because you, you was the big man on campus. Then one day, the teacher said, I think, I think you're not quite as, as dull as you used to be. You've really, you've really excelled. In fact, I'm going to send you up to the next grade. And the next grade, you're the small kid, not the big kid. That's how we are spiritually. We want to hang out with people that aren't nearly as graduated as what we are in the spirit. Because as long as we're that, then they come to us and it makes us feel really good. How dare you not find somebody who's a lot farther down the road than you are so that you can feel small with them and then you don't feel so big with your other friends so that what you're aspiring to be over here is helping you to be the better friend over Y'all ain't hearing anything. We, we, we got we to gotta bridge that gap. 
You need people that, that, are, that are not as far along as you are. You need that because they need you in their life. Just like the people ahead of you, they need you in their life too because they need to be pouring back as well. Here's our problem. Hey, we all made it to third grade, and you know what? Third grade still gets in heaven. So if we can just all stay here and we'll just make a pact that we'll just hang out together, we'll just stay in third grade together, then we'll all make heaven and earth to be great. But you're going to have to stand before God and give an account to him why you didn't get the kindergartners and the first graders and the second graders to the third grade where you were and why you didn't pursue him more because you could have done so much more down the road than you could hanging out in third grade. I'm oversimplifying this. But I'm doing it to prove a point that people get as much of God as they want, and then they want to hit the pause button. Here's the problem with God. God don't have a pause button. You're either growing or dying, living or dying, going farther into him or farther away from him. He said, well, that's just not fair. Really? Do that with your mate. You can't pause your relationship with him either. You can't pause your relationship with your kids. You can't treat your kids like you do some stray cat and you feed them and throw some water at them and you change the litter box once in a while and give an occasional pet. Your kids will divorce you. They'll want nothing to do with you. Why? Because you're not investing in them. Jesus wants somebody that will invest in him so he can invest back. That, that, that's what relationship is. There's no hit the pause button. There's no time out. Thirdly, they had confidence. They had confidence. They had confidence in who God is and in his character more than they did in what God would do. Let me try this side. They had confidence in who God is and his character. But they did not know what God would do. That's why they said, we ain't bound to you, nibs. If God saves us, woohoo. If God don't save us, woohoo. Either way, we out of here, Jack. You see what I'm saying? They, they, they were very bold in their faith because they knew either way they were getting delivered from, from nibs. There was a man, true story, who was recounting the story of when he was a kid in grade school. And uh, listen, it was okay for me to call my sister names, to thump her, to make fun of her, whatever, because I'm the brother. But if you try doing what I did, you're mine. Okay? So here was, here was this brother in school, and some kids were making fun of his sister and calling her names that were inappropriate. And rather than going and telling the teacher, he just dealt with it right there. So there's blood, crying, and he's just on top wailing on him. So a teacher scoops him up, takes him down to the office, said, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm acutely aware I'm in trouble. And so while they're around the desk, one of the faculty and staff says, well, what if what those boys were saying about your sister ain't wrong? And he come across the desk to get, to get the, the staff, and again, he got in trouble. So they, they, they call his dad. Hey, Mr. Dad, your son is in the office. Yeah, what's in the office for? Because he beat up on some kids for calling his sister names, and then he tried to beat up on a staff for suggesting that they might not be wrong. He said, okay. He said, what's the punishment for, for fighting? And they said, suspension. He said, then what are you calling me for? Suspend the boy. So they hung up. The boy goes home suspended. He's mad. Throws his books down. What's your problem, Dad? Don't love me no more? Why didn't you defend me? And so the dad sat his boy down and said, listen, if you do wrong, 
There's consequences. And if I'd have found out that those boys were saying it and the faculty was saying what they said and you didn't defend her, we'd be having a completely different conversation. But we're not having that conversation. We're having a conversation that I'm, I'm so proud of you for doing what you did. You did right. But please understand that even when you do right, there's consequences for doing right. Tell that to William Tyndale. I don't know. Tell that to a man named Jesus who did right and still paid the price. So just because you're doing right, see, we live in this society where the government's teaching us and, and the world's trying to teach us this entitlement thing that as long as you do right, you don't get in trouble. <laughs> That's for dumb people. You do wrong, there's a consequence. You do right, there's a consequence. So that kid was able to... to, to go through his suspension with a better relationship with his dad, with a better relationship with his sister, and walk back on campus with a newfound confidence both in himself and around those that knew him because he let them know, I'm willing to pay the price for doing the right thing. Would to God that the church would be willing to pay the price for doing the right thing. Well, I know that my friend over here is a degenerate and doesn't know Jesus, but I'm afraid if I say something to him, this whole row is going to be mad at me. Would to God that we'd pay the price for telling the right thing, saying the right thing, doing the right thing. Well, I might get unfriended. And they might make fun of me. I might lose my job. I might get demoted. Nobody's going to understand why I'm saying it. Why I'm, who cares? You got one to please. This ain't them. Am I making sense? Does it sound like I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to go off half cocked. I, I'm just trying to say we, we work so hard just to kind of walk the line. You know what I'm saying? Just, just not offend this side and not offend that side. If we, we just get through life just kind of going. It doesn't work that way. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. I'm skipping. Our problem is we don't have a problem being comfortable. I'm comfortable with the size church we got going on. Let's not rock the boat. I mean, I know, I know that God wants us to win people. We win people out there and send them, you know, but let's, let's just stay where we're at because it's, it's, I, I've got my own, my own seat. I've got my own parking place. I've already got, I've got the pastors trained on what coffee and, and sissy sauce to get. You know what I'm saying? So I, I know that, you know, if I, if, if I slip Nicholas a little money, he'll, he'll adjust the sound to my liking and, and you, you, We get accustomed to what we got. And watch this. We work so hard at preserving what we have that we don't get anything better. Right. How many of you would have been excited about getting married? if the agreement that you had with both sets of parents before you got married is that you never had kids. Huh? Notwithstanding an evil society and the things that you can make up in your head, the truth is that when people get married... They get married young. I'm not talking about your sixth or twelfth attempt. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about when, when, when people that love each other get married, there's an expectation that their love will produce offspring. And when we come together with the Lord, there's an expectation that there should be How many of your spiritual children will there be in line behind you when you stand before God?
in Daniel 3, you know, there, I, I've talked to you about this before. There's a, there's a school of thought with a lot of evidence that says that the Hebrew boys were eunuchs. Why? Because Nebs didn't want them to have offspring. In Daniel 1, verse 7, the commander of the officials gave them Babylonian names. He named Daniel Belshazzar. Hananiah, he named Shadrach. Mishael, he named Meshach. And Azariah, he named Abednego. They were taken from their land, taken from their homes, taken from their parents. They were castrated against their will force-fed a diet and an education from the Babylonians and renamed. The devil was working so hard to mess up their identity. Oh, God, help me right now. Trying, trying to take their identity. Put them in a new environment. Give them new parents. Give them a different education. Castrate them. Change their diet. Sound like any place you know? Yes. Trying to change who they are, change their identity. But that's the one thing they couldn't touch. That's why, that's why Nebs got so mad at them because they said, no matter what, you've already done all this mess to us, but I'm telling you, no matter what, you cannot make us bow to you. You may have done something with our body, but you cannot do that with our heart. Yeah. Does that make sense? You know, right before they went into the furnace, they could have compromised. They really could have. They could have made some excuses. Here's some, here's some workarounds that they could have said. You ready? One, they could have said, well, I'll bow down physically, but I won't really worship the idol. I'll trick them. They could have said, we won't become idol worshipers, but we'll do it this one time and then pray for forgiveness. How about this one? The king has absolute power, and God says we've got to obey the rulers of the land, so God will obviously understand that I'm doing what the king said. <laughs> oh, I'm not done. <laughs> I'm not done. How about this one? It was the king that appointed us and raised us up. Therefore, we owe this to him. How about this one? This is a foreign land, so God will excuse us for following the customs of the land that he obviously caused us to be in. How about our ancestors set up idols in God's very own temple? This isn't half as bad as what our ancestors did, so. Here's a famous one. We're not hurting anybody to do this. If we get ourselves killed, and then some other heathens wind up taking our high positions that we have in the kingdom, then that's not going to help the rest of our people. I'm doing our people a service if I go ahead and do this because it keeps me empowered to help them. We've got to learn that standing for God is painful. It's just, it's painful. One more illustration. I'm going to pray for you. How many's getting something out of this today? <laughs> uh, this is a true story. On September the 1st, 1939, I won't ask how many of you were alive in 1939. So on September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany began what we call World War II and swept across Europe in what Hitler has called his lightning war. When it was all said and done, Hitler had driven the Allies back to the sea, and nearly 500,000 British and French troops were trapped in the small city of Dunkirk 
on the English Channel, which is also called Dunkirk. Germany had them at their mercy, and Hitler's armored division were only 15 miles away, and the Luftwaffe bombed and strafed the hapless armies below. Several of the leaders in Britain discussed trying to bribe or cut a deal with Hitler. Sir Edmund Ironside, chief of the Imperial General Staff, confided to a colleague that, quote, this is the end of the British Empire, end quote. Harold Nicholson, a member of the British government, wrote his wife that they might be compelled to commit suicide. It was at that desperate moment that the churches of Britain called for a national day of prayer. Numerous political leaders, newspapers, editors, and King George VI issued a call for a national day of prayer on Sunday, May 26th. And the people were flocked to the churches in droves and long lines were formed outside of places of worship. As the British people anxiously awaited word of their fate, a three-word message was transmitted from the besieged army. And it read, But if not. But if not. The British public instantly recognized the message. It's a reference to the biblical story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before the king, Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. Our God is able to save us, but if not, we will remain faithful to him anyway. That's the word they got, but if not. At 7 o'clock, May 26th, the order was issued to attempt a desperate evacuation of Dunkirk. Every tiny vessel and private craft was sent across the open often treacherous waters of the English Channel. But something very strange happened over the nine days of that rescue. Hitler ordered his troops to halt in order to give the, the Luftwaffe the chance to seal their victory. But German air power was hampered by the extremely unfavorable weather in the skies. Additionally, a fog settled in that hid the troops as they boarded the boats that came to save them. And the normally treacherous channel waters became unnaturally calm. At the end of nine days of the half million men trapped at Dunkirk, 336,000 were saved. Why? Because our God is mighty to save and to deliver. Doesn't that sound a little bit like the children of Israel at the Red Sea? Pillar of cloud by day pillar of fire by night. How many times has the devil looked at you and said, I'm going to turn up the heat. I'm going to turn up the heat until you stop praising, stop worshiping, stop giving, stop encouraging, obeying, Stop fighting. Stop praying. At times when we have a big church potluck, there's a lot of set up and tear down. A lot of the stuff that gets stored on the side has got to be taken to the connex box. A lot of stuff that's in the connex box has got to be taken out. T tables have to be set up all over the room. Chairs unfolded and set up. Tablecloths, food serving lines, uh, sound systems, speakers, amps, microphones, AC or heat. Uh, so many things. That's not included. We haven't talked about the kitchen. And too often, one or two people wind up setting up and one or two people wind up tearing down for over 100 people that are coming to partake. So Rachel started pressing me, said, hey, we're going to have a big event. Hey, at the end of service, if you just asked the men if they would take about 10 minutes, it would take them literally 10 minutes in the gym to do what it might take us a couple hours to get done by ourselves. You follow? Here's the problem. How many likes to boat? Ski, tube, fish? How many has ever been on an underpowered boat? 
Huh? He got this big old boat and a 25 horse. I mean, you're doing like two miles an hour, but it beats rowing, right? Or you get a pontoon and it's got a 65 or 75. It's just, you ain't just going to go very fast. Now I've seen tritunes with two or sometimes three 250 horse. Monsters. Too many churches are like a big ship that's got a lot of people on it that's being propelled by a trolling motor. Because everybody wants to ride. Not everybody wants to drive. There are people all around this ship we call no excuses that are drowning that we won't always be able to get to if we don't have some horsepower. And just because we're all up on the rail going, there he is, there's one, there's one right there. Oh, he's gone. There's one. We got a lot of spotters. Can I tell you some of the stuff I wrestle with at night? When I'm praying over no excuses and I'm praying over you, when I see your face, I'm calling your name out and just praying over situations and whatnot. I'm like, Lord, honestly, if this is the pinnacle of where we're going to be, we can hang out here till you come. I'm okay. I'm really okay. I have no ego in this race. I'm good. But there's something on the inside that drives me. It drives me to not be satisfied. And so what happens is I wind up working harder and harder and longer and harder and longer and longer and harder because I believe that we're, we're to have a bigger ship to bring more people, to save more lost But that didn't work in either, because then I just ran out of gas. So I've just had to go back to the Lord and say, God, I think my heart's right, but my methodology is a little messed up. And so in the same way that many hands makes quick work in the gym, so does many hands and hearts in ministry make quick work of this season that we're in. Personal belief system, I'm not prophesying. Personal belief system. I believe that things are turning and they're going to get a lot better for a season. But as soon as that season's over, I think it's going to get the worst that the Western world has ever seen. Remember the story of Joseph when God caused him to interpret the king's dream he said seven years of plenty seven years of famine and so during the years of plenty he kept socking away and socking away and socking away so that when the seven years of famine arrived they had a storehouse to pull from i believe we got a little bit of time where we can grow expand get deeper roots all these things but I believe there's a season coming that it's going to be wretchedly terrible. And we won't be able to do what we're able to do now. So there's something powerful about now. I don't know who I'm talking to. For all I know, 80% of you walk out of here and go, do you, um, you, you catch what he, I'm not sure what he meant by that. Did you catch that? But I think that there's a, a couple of handfuls of people that know that you've been kicking against the goads and the pricks that God has been setting in your life because we like where we're at. It's comfortable eating where we're eating. It's comfortable hanging where we're hanging. It's comfortable knowing the people that we know. It's comfortable. 
my question to you is, are you comfortable? And if you are looking back on that in the next four years or so, are you going to be okay with the excuses that you gave for staying where we're at instead of pursuing what God's called us to do? Watch this. There's consequences for both. There's consequences for not changing anything. There's a whole other set of consequences for saying, God, we're going to give it all up to do what you called us to do. So it doesn't matter what we do because there will still be a price to pay. But sometimes I think we need to consider the cost and say, Lord, I'm willing to pay that price to achieve this in you. My goal is I want to see you graduate. I want to see you grow. I want to see you expand. I want to see you function in power and might and authority. I want to see those things. But I need you to want that for you as much or more than I do. I've seen a lot of parents that had big dreams for their kids. But the kids never had dreams for themselves. I believe that the scripture is true, that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. I don't want to be so comfortable that I stop making steps. Because it's the steps that are ordered. I believe that our God is with us. He'll supply every need. I believe he's already supplied the needs ahead of time. He's able to deliver us from all the issues that is plaguing us individually and corporately. But if not, are we strong enough in our love and our commitment to him that if it doesn't happen the way that we think it should, that we won't curse him, we won't blame him, and we won't refuse to obey him because we didn't have the end that we anticipated. Our call is to endure till the end. Our call is to tarry until he comes. That does not mean to pause until he comes. That means to continue to serve until he arrives. I end with Joshua twenty four fifteen. If it is acceptable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The post my wife made was dead accurate. Those that are not serving the Lord and those that are serving the Lord have the same excuses. It's just those that are truly serving the Lord refuse to use them. So I'm asking you to understand that it's more than coincidence and a funny little quirky name that we're called No Excuses Ministries. And I'm asking those of you that believe that you're called to be connected here and to grow roots here, that you also take on the heart mission that you won't give yourself the ability to offer excuses instead of action. It's not just your eternity that depends on it. It's the host of everybody else that you're called to reach. If you caught any part of this message today on the stream, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for catching any, any part of it. Hopefully all of it, but for whatever part you got, I pray that it, it reached you right where you're at. If you're looking to find a new family, we're looking to grow the family of God here at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., every Thursday evening at 645 p.m. So until our next appointed time, God bless you.
Have an incredible day.